George Weigel is a distinguished senior fellow of the Center of Ethics and Public Policy in Washington, DC, where he holds the William Simon Chair in Catholic Studies. Along with a master's degree from St. Michael's College, University of Toronto, he's been awarded, I think last count, 18 honorary doctorates, ranging from philosophy and divinity to law and social science. I won't try to list his books, I think at least 17. Uh, I tried to get a sampling on one page. And if anyone's interested, I bet you'll sign a few. There's a couple, one copy left of outside after the lecture. Uh, I'm sure most of you know his important and influential biography of John Paul II of the Pope, which first appeared in 1999, followed by a second volume in 2010. It was described as a landmark portrait of a man who not only left an indelible mark on the Catholic Church, but also changed the course of world history. I particularly liked a remark by Mr. Weigel characterizing his project by reference to something the Pope said to him. Other biographies try to understand me from outside, but I can only be understood from inside. To me, that captures the idea of being able to capture a world historical figure from the inside is a remarkable achievement. I've heard from many of you who read Mr. Weigel's weekly column, The Catholic Difference, which is syndicated to newspapers around the country. I myself come upon his reflections in First Things, a prominent journal on issues of religion and public life. In fact, I opened it today and you had the lead piece, which I didn't have time to read. We're fortunate to have Mr. Weigel here in New Orleans tonight, just a few days after returning from Krakow, where he apparently spends time regularly, including directing a summer seminar on the free society, which attracts students from the United States, Poland, elsewhere in Central and Eastern Europe. I should add one other distinction. In our Judeo-Christian Studies lecture series, started by Father, Father Val McGinnis in 1980, I believe George Weigel may be the speaker who has returned most often. He was last here in 2003, speaking on moral leadership and world politics, and before that in 1995, speaking on religion in contemporary American society, I think was the decline of contemporary American society, and I'm afraid we may soon hear that the problems he has diagnosed over these years have yet to be solved. Let me conclude with one point that will be resonant to many of us here, especially I hope to students who hear me speak so often about the importance of understanding the roots of the Western tradition. I've heard George Weigel identify the roots of the West as Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome. If, as he puts it, Athens stands for faith in human reason and Rome for rule by law, he sees Jerusalem, or biblical faith, as the glue that holds the whole together. Perhaps we will learn a little of how he understands that in tonight's talk, followed by a brief question period, modernity, biblical faith, and the crisis of the West. Please join me in welcoming George Weigel. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Berger. It's wonderful to be back at Tulane for the third time. I just keep coming for the cholesterol. <laughs> uh, Dr. Berger is one of the two reasons I'm here. The other is my friend Ken Bickford. Since we have philosophers present, I will note that Dr. Berger is the formal cause of my being here, and Mr. Bickford is the efficient cause of my being here. I am the material cause of your being here, and you all are the final cause of the whole thing happening. So uh, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, this rather large set of questions implied in the title uh, that Dr. Berger and I agreed on, um, began to get focused in my mind in a particular way uh, 19 years ago this past summer when I was in Paris uh, in the summer of 1997 for the first time since I, had, I was a, a young teenager. And I went to a part of Paris that did not exist in 1964 when I was first there which is an enormous mixed-use development on the west side of the 
River Seine called La Défense. Uh, and at the center of this new development is what is called the Great Arch of La Défense. It is 40 stories tall. It's 348 feet wide. It is covered with two and a half acres of white Carrara marble. And it was the monument created by President Francois Mitterrand for the 200th anniversary of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in uh, 1789. It's a giant featureless Lego, uh, which on a hot Parisian August afternoon is, is literally mesmerizing as this Carrara marble gleams at you. And you can take an elevator up to the top, uh, and the top three stories of this are in our office space, where something called the International Foundation for Human Rights is lodged. And as I stood up on the top of this colossal Lego, uh, looking east, uh, it's a spectacular view of Paris, down the Champs-Élysées, through the Arc de Triomphe, on to the Ile de la Cité, and of course, Notre Dame Cathedral, a thought came into my head. Which culture would better protect, could more adequately ground the human rights that this colossal cube was meant to celebrate? Was it the culture that produced this geometrically perfect but featureless giant Lego? Or, looking down towards an older part of Paris, would it be the culture that produced the unmatching spires, the stone bosses, the stained glass, the holy asymmetry, if you will, of Notre Dame Cathedral. That question must have bounced around inside my head for several years because it came back to me uh, in 2003 when uh, the countries of uh, Western Europe were debating a new constitutional treaty for the about to be expanded European Union, which was adding uh, 10 new members incorporating the new democracies of uh, Central Europe that had auto-liberated themselves in 1989. That constitutional treaty is some 450 pages long always a bad sign for a constitution. If it's longer than six pages, you're in trouble. This was 450 pages long, but the fiercest argument during the debate, the public debate over that treaty, was about the preamble, uh, which uh, was going to cite the sources of 21st century Europe's commitments to human rights, democracy, the rule of law, civility, tolerance, all the good things. And the debate was whether biblical religion could be cited as one of those sources. And after a year of extraordinary fuss, um, biblical religion didn't make the cut. The sources of contemporary Europe's commitments to human rights, democracy, the rule of law, civility, tolerance, etc., were listed in the preamble as the classical heritage, the enlightenment, and modern thought. Now, as I wrote at the time, perhaps more flippantly than um, the circumstances warranted, if that's your idea of you know, where your roots are, uh, you're suggesting that nothing of consequence for 21st century Europe happened between Marcus Aurelius and Descartes. 
which is about 1,400 years, which, as I wrote in this column, was an awfully long time for nothing to have happened here. So this whole exercise struck me as a deliberate exercise in historical amnesia, a kind of wiping of the slate of historical memory, indeed of cultural memory. But then the question posed itself, in aid of what? And that question got answered by uh, perhaps the most famous piece of polemic uh, written during that fierce argument about whether uh, the Judeo-Christian heritage would make it into the new European constitutional treaty, which was a lengthy op-ed piece published in a dozen newspapers simultaneously all over the continent by two of the leading intellectuals of Europe at the time, the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas and the French uh, thinker uh, Jacques Derrida. And in that article, uh, Habermas and Derrida argued that the new Europe must be one that is, quote, neutral between worldviews. Now, as I hope anyone who has taken Philosophy 101 here at uh, Tulane will immediately understand, there is no such thing as neutrality between worldviews. The very claim that there is is itself a worldview. Uh, the thing is self-referentially inconsistent. It's self-contradictory. But it did put in mind, for me, an older question that had been raised by the English historian Christopher Dawson in the 1940s at the end of the Second World War when surveying the wreckage of a Europe that had essentially tried to commit civilizational suicide between 1914 and 1945, asked, can a secular society with no end beyond its own satisfaction long endure? seemed to me an important way to put this. Now, while I was thinking about all of this, I went back to have another look at a book that I had first uh, read uh, in the late 1990s, although it had been published 50 years earlier, by the French Catholic thinker Henri de Lubac called The Drama of Atheistic Humanism. Father de Lubac was perhaps the most influential Catholic theologian of the 20th century. He'd certainly make the top three uh, cut. He was a great influence on the Second Vatican Council. During the Second World War, he was a rescuer of French Jews and ran an underground uh, Catholic publication called Témoignage Chrétien, Christian Witness. Uh, that was one of the principal Catholic resistance publications in, in France. In the course of all of that uh, awfulness uh, in the 1940s, the early 1940s, de Lubac asked himself a question. How did this happen? How did a century which had begun with such high hopes for the human future, uh, high hopes for a maturing humanity tutored by uh, science uh, to create uh, a world of knowledge, a world of civility, a world of human fraternity. How did all of that turn within, at this stage of the game, at that stage of the game, four decades, turn into mountains of corpses and oceans of blood, three totalitarian systems, uh, Auschwitz, the Gulag, the whole horror show. How had this happened? And Lubach traced the crisis of the West in the mid 20th century to what he called in this book uh, the drama of atheistic humanism. 
European high culture in its principal figures, according to Father de Lubach, had hijacked the humanistic project, uh, emptied it of what was once its vital Jewish and Christian components, and set in motion dynamics, social, political, psychological, national, that had led to the catastrophe of Europe in the mid 20th century. This atheistic humanism he saw as the product of at least four major figures in 19th century uh, European uh, high culture. Uh, Auguste Comte and his positivism, that which can be known is only that which can be known through the scientific method. Ludwig Feuerbach and his subjectivism, God is simply the projection of humanity's highest aspirations. Of course, the materialism of Karl Marx, history is the uh, exhaust fumes of, of the means of production, and perhaps above all, the will to power uh, of Friedrich Nietzsche. You put that cocktail together, uh, shake it up, and you get the volatility, according to de Lubach, that was a primary factor in Europe coming apart at precisely the moment when it was expected to take a new turn into a brighter civilizational future. And what was common to this atheistic humanism was that it regarded the God of the Bible, the God of Jews and Christians, as the enemy of human maturation and liberation. Now this, de Lubach pointed out, was in fact a great inversion. Because if you, if you actually look at the history of uh, religious faith and its impact on society, the God of the Bible comes into human history as a liberator, not as an oppressor. Think of the gods of the ancient world. You have the Phoenician and Carthaginian Moloch, who demanded and got the sacrifice of children. I was just reading a review of a new biography of Hannibal uh, the other day, and apparently there have now been discovered 20,000 infants' skulls uh, in what was once Carthage before the Romans spit on their hands and really got down to the job of destroying Carthage, uh, who were all uh, sacrificed to uh, this god Moloch. Or think of, the gods of the, think of the gods of the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, who treat humanity as material for their amusement. Uh, even the strongest of men, Achilles, you know, is ultimately a plaything of the gods. Uh, into that kind of a world, the God of the Bible, the God who first reveals himself to Abraham, who enters into covenant with Moses and the people of Israel, uh, the God whom Jesus called Father, came as a great liberator. Uh, he did not demand the sacrifice of children. Indeed, the Hebrew prophets uh, railed against the Phoenician practice of of uh, child sacrifice as they railed against no other uh, sin. Uh, he did not, this God of the Bible, play games with human beings, but rather he entered into uh, a covenant relationship with his people and accompanied them through history, drawing out of them what was most noble in their own aspirations. So to take that reality and invert it such that this God of the Bible who had come into history as liberator now is positioned by the project of atheistic humanism 
as the principal enemy was to do something very uh, deep to uh, the culture of the Western world. And that will bring me in a minute to what Professor Berger said at the end, but, but in order to get there, let's talk just a moment about what is this crisis of modernity, this crisis of the West in, in what I think we have to call now post-modernity. Uh, it first appeared in Europe uh, in a book I published on this subject over 10 years ago now called The Cube and the Cathedral. I said that the crisis of civilizational morale that was evident to me in Europe uh, in the first decade of the new uh, century was like the canary in the coal mine. Uh, as many of you know, in the old days, before there was adequate ventilation in coal mines, uh, miners would take a canary in a cage down into the, the mine shaft. And when the canary got wobbly, that was a sign that the air was getting toxic. And when the canary went toes up, uh, that was the sign that it was time to get out. And I was suggesting that this crisis of civilizational morale in Europe was functioning as a kind of canary in the coal mine for the entire Western world. I wish I had been wrong. Uh, I fear I was right. And the manifestations of that are all around us. A sclerotic government that can't address real problems, a profound social division, the inability or unwillingness in large parts of the Western world, uh, I'd probably exempt Canada from this, but the inability or unwillingness to assimilate immigrants from other civilizational orbits. Uh, perhaps most dramatically, the demographic winter that has settled over the entire Western world. Uh, if you look at the countries of the European Union, I don't think you will find a single country that has a total fertility rate uh, at the replacement level. Uh, which means that Europe is, uh, by deliberate acts of infertility, uh, cutting off the human future in a most elemental sense. That uh, demographic winter is now beginning to manifest itself in the United States. I think last year we were just under uh, a replacement level TFR. Uh, it's certainly true in other parts of the Western world as well. And it seems to me when an entire part of the world that is healthier, wealthier, and more secure than it's ever been uh, fails to create the human future in the most elemental sense of creating the human future by creating future generations, uh, there's, a, there's a deep problem of, of culture at work. And then uh, after sclerotic government, social division, inability to assimilate immigrants, and demographic winter, we have the phenomenon of political correctness, which is destroying democratic debate throughout the Western world uh, to the point where um, uh, that debate is becoming more and more impossible for fear of legal consequences. This is true in Canada. Uh, it's certainly true in uh, Europe. And my hunch is that it will soon be true in the United States, despite our robust First Amendment and the robust interpretation of that by, uh, by the Supreme Court. Now, how did all of that happen? Here we come to uh, what I have come to think of as the West as a, as a three-legged stool. You can think of this civilization we call the West as a stool which is held up by three legs, Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome. The Jerusalem leg, biblical religion, gave the West the notion, which is, I think, unique to Western civilization, that history is not cyclical, that history is not chaos and randomness, one damn thing after another. History is pilgrimage. 
History is journey. History is adventure. History goes from somewhere to somewhere. And of course, the primordial image for this comes from the Hebrew Bible in the Exodus. That's a terribly important idea uh, in the history of the West. It raised up people who thought about their lives and their responsibilities in history of a distinctive sort. The second leg of the stool is Athens, where from, Professor Berger will correct me, let's say the seventh century uh, BC on, you get this uh, conviction, I think again, unique to the Western world, that there are truths built into the world and into us, that we can know those truths by an exercise of reason, we may not grasp them perfectly or completely, but we can be sure of some things. Uh, this is another terribly important idea in putting together the civilization of the West. I mean, think of what uh, uh, think of what would have happened put on my Catholic theologian hat here a minute. Think of what would have happened if the first Christian missionaries had turned right rather than turning left when they left what was then Judea. Suppose the first Christian encounter with a developed civilization had been in India rather than in Greece and Rome. Well, in India, which had a highly developed civilization at that time, there was no principle of non-contradiction. Something could be and not be at the same time. That would have made for a very different experience. Instead, they turned left into what we call Asia Minor, later into Macedonia, Greece, Rome itself, and encountered a civilization that did have the principle of non-contradiction, which was essential to the formation of Christian doctrine. No principle of non-contradiction, no creed. Uh, no principle of non-contradiction, no uh, philosophical working out of the gospel claim that Jesus is Lord. Um, if they had turned right into India, they would bump into a civilization where Jesus could be Lord and not Lord at the same time, and everybody was happy with that. Okay? So the principle of non-contradiction, which of course is at the basis of science. I mean, it's rarely asked adequately enough why what we know as the scientific method only emerged out of the civilization of the West. One key piece of that puzzle goes back to 7th century BCE Athens. And then the third leg of the stool was Rome. Uh, and the conviction, perhaps best exemplified by Cicero, that the rule of law is superior morally, philosophically, and practically to the rule of coercion in organizing society. Romans didn't always live that terribly well, but the conviction was there, and the conviction entered the bloodstream of the West. Now, if you put my stool together with the Delubach analysis of the drama of atheistic humanism, I think you begin to get uh, a deeper insight into what has happened over the past 100, 150 years in our uh, civilization. The drama of atheistic humanism was that it sought to kick out the Jerusalem leg from the stool, and did so rather successfully. 
as manifest by that argument in 2003, 2004, over whether biblical religion could be mentioned in the preamble to the European Constitution as having something to do with contemporary Europe's commitments to all the good things. And the answer was no. That was a very successful uh, piece of intellectual inversion. And it remains true today. We're, we're used here in the United States to a robust uh, religion and society debate, sometimes vulgar, but sometimes not so vulgar, sometimes quite high level. Uh, uh, Dr. Berger mentioned first things. There is nothing like first things between Dublin and Kiev. I know because I'm there and I've tried to plant seeds of such things, and it's just not there. Uh, and that's in part because of a huge cultural difference. So, okay, the first leg got knocked out of the stool in the late 19th century. Well, we know what happens when you got a stool with two legs rather than three legs. The stool is getting wobbly. And the wobble, I think, became manifest with the rise of, of what is called uh, postmodernism and its conviction that while there may be your truth and my truth, there is nothing properly describable as the truth, hence the Habermas Derrida proposal that the new Europe must be neutral between worldviews, which is, of course, itself a worldview stance. And the kind of irrationality we have seen in public life, and frankly in intellectual life, and even more frankly in university life in recent decades, seems to me a result of that leg of the stool getting kicked out. Now, why did that happen? Okay, it happened because of certain developments. I understand somebody was, are you teaching something on Kant this semester? Somebody mentioned Kant to me earlier. post uh, the post kantian decline of metaphysics in the philosophical world had something to do with this. But perhaps more to the point was the impact of the Jerusalem leg getting knocked out on the Athenian leg, which I think is too rarely common. This is more explicitly clear in, in Christian theology, but I think it's implicit and in some respects explicit in, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, and especially in um, uh, the Greek books of, of the Septuagint. And that is the notion that the creator of the world imprinted a logic into the world imprinted a truth into the world, created a world that was inherently knowable, that we could get at by the arts of reason as well as by revelation. Christians call this the Logos, beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through the Word, all that is came into being. So there is a divine logic built into the world that's reflected in the creator's creatures such that there's a, there's a symmetry between our minds and the world. Interestingly enough, uh, I find that um, the higher ends of physics, particularly astrophysics, and some um, of my friends who are mathematicians beyond my imagining since all you have to do is ask my wife about the state of our checkbook to know about my mathematical <laughs> skills. Um, mathematicians and physicists all now beginning to say there's an inherent knowability in the world. Uh, that this, this universe is structured in such fine tolerances to make it possible that there's an inherent rationality in it. So they're coming at this from, from their own disciplinary direction, but that's gone now. Uh, when you knock out the Jerusalem leg, you take with it what is 
clear in the Book of Wisdom, in the uh, uh, Septuagint, you, you take out what is clear in the, in the Gospel of John, this divine imprint that underwrites, if you will, the rationality of the world, so you get the season of irrationality in which we find ourselves. And so we now have a stool with one leg. And you know what happens with that. It falls down. And that which is sitting on it ends up in an uncomfortable position. And that, I think, is the collapse of the notion of the rule of law that is implicit in uh, what a prominent European intellectual named Joseph Ratzinger, uh, perhaps better known to some of you as Pope Benedict XVI, called the dictatorship of relativism. When he said that on April 18, 2005, uh, there was a lot of cluck clucking and head wagging. I mean, isn't this a terrible exaggeration? Well, actually, no, it isn't. Because if there is only your truth and my truth, and nothing that either one of us recognizes as the truth, then there is no horizon of judgment against which we can rationally settle our differences. So if there is no such horizon, what happens when your truth and my truth come into conflict? Well, Nietzsche saw this coming 150 years before. You will impose your power on me, or I will impose my power on you. And because the dominant cultural forces at the moment are the forces of relativism, CF, the fall of the Athenian and Jerusalem legs, you get the use of coercive state power to impose a relativistic uh, ethic on all of society. I was made aware of the latest iteration of this phenomenon uh, yesterday when I was talking to my friend uh, Cardinal Tom Collins, the Archbishop of Toronto, uh, to prepare for a talk I'm giving up there to a group of lawyers and judges next week. And I knew that uh, the Canadian Supreme Court, uh, aided and abetted by the Parliament, had created a euthanasia regime uh, and imposed it on all of Canada. But I didn't realize quite how grave the imposition was, because Cardinal Collins told me that the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Ontario, which is the accrediting body for doctors, if you want to practice, you've got to get their certificate or permission or a good housekeeping seal of approval has decided that there are to be no conscience rights, as we would understand them, in this matter of euthanasia, uh, that if a, an Ontario physician who will not euthanize a patient refuses to do so, that physician must make what the College of Physicians and Surgeons calls an effective referral, meaning you are, you are legally obliged to find that disturbed patient, someone who will kill them. Now, if that is not the dictatorship of relativism, I'm not sure what uh, is. So that is our situation, uh, at least as I understand it, in very broad uh, history of ideas terms. Um, I mentioned Christopher Dawson, can a secular society with no end beyond its own satisfactions long endure? Uh, another way of putting that question, which is really the question of whether the Western project can endure without the Jerusalem and Athenian legs of the stool was posed in the mid-1970s, some 20 years after, 30 years after Dawson, by uh, a German legal theorist named Ernst Wolfgang Bockenförder, 
where, who noted that, as he put it, the modern secular liberal democratic state rests on a foundation of moral cultural premises that it cannot itself generate. Put another way, we would say the modern liberal democratic state re relies on a fund of social capital that it can't itself generate. Or, put still another way, it takes a certain kind of people living certain virtues to make the machinery of democratic self-governance work so that the net result is genuine human flourishing, not human degradation and the dictatorship of relativism. How do we resolve the Bakkenförder dilemma? Uh, that's a huge question, maybe on my fourth invite back to Tulane. I can address that. Let me just suggest, though, in concluding here tonight, that there is something to be learned in thinking about that question, in thinking about how we generate the social capital, the virtue necessary to make this adventure of democratic self-governance, which is at the center of the Western project politically work, there's something to be learned from Arnold Toynbee here. Um, has anyone here actually read all of Toynbee? That would be uh, an amazing uh, uh, achievement if you did. Uh, but in all of that stuff, uh, you find Toynbee's notion that what really generates change in history is what he called creative minorities. Uh, people with a grasp on the truth of things and a compelling way of expressing that who then bend the curve of history in a more humane direction. I think we can find all sorts of evidence of that uh, in the history of the Western world. In the history of this country, we can look to that extraordinary uh, gathering of talent uh, at the time of the American founding and the framing of the Constitution and see those figures as a creative minority. They were not uh, every man. I mean, they were not, this was not a, uh, a populist thing. This was uh, a republic defined and structured uh, by a creative minority. Uh, I think we can see that in the, in the available moral example of desirable social change in our time, which was the classical civil rights movement in the United States in the 1950s, and perhaps early 1960s. A creative minority, which by calling the entire society to live out its its noblest aspirations in a more uh, obvious way, affected enormous uh, change uh, that was moral and cultural before it was legal. I mean, I grew up in Baltimore, which was a segregated city uh, at the time I was a boy. And the most extraordinary change from the mid-1950s to the mid-1960s which took place before the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, or um, the Great Society programs that followed, was the change in attitude and the change in language. People simply didn't talk the way about other people the way they did before. And why was that? Because they had been summoned to something higher and better. They hadn't been bludgeoned into this in a politically correct way. They had been summoned to something higher. So there's an example uh, of a creative uh, minority. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of destructive minorities, uh, intellectual minorities in our culture right now. Uh, but perhaps those of us who still believe that faith and reason go together, that reason purifies religious conviction of superstition, and religious conviction keeps reason from getting too full of itself 
uh, and imagining it is the sole route to genuine knowledge in this world. Um, uh, perhaps those of us who believe that, and I think that's embodied in this chair and in this program and this lectureship, uh, can, by exemplifying that in our own lives, uh, call our fellow citizens, uh, and indeed call our whole civilization, to a better performance than we have managed to put on in, uh, in recent uh, decades. Um, let me mention one other creative minority uh, from which we might take some heart. As, as Professor Berger mentioned, I have spent the better part of the last uh, 25 years now uh, chronicling the story of the auto-liberation of Central and Eastern Europe, particularly through the person of Pope St. John Paul II. And I remain even more convinced today than when I began all of this work in 1990 that the crucial determinant of what we call the revolution of 1989 in Central and Eastern Europe was the determination of a critical mass of people, a creative minority, to do what Václav Havel called them to do, namely live in the truth. Live in the truth of their own human dignity, live in the truth about what makes for uh, noble human relationships, live in the truth about what is justice, uh, live in the truth about the nature of freedom and its tether to both truth and goodness. So there's something even closer uh, to us in time. Uh, that's something of which many of us have living memories and of which some of the exemplars are still among us. So if we can imagine that kind of living in the truth here, uh, then we can imagine, we can begin to imagine uh, a way to um, initiate the work of cultural reconstruction, uh, which I believe is the absolute prerequisite for the political reconstruction uh, of the Western uh, project and the saving of the freedom project in the 21st century. Thank you. When you were talking about the three pillars right. and you talked about the Roman pillar, you there's just one sentence that I sort of latched on to you said some distinguished law from coercion. Right. Did you explain that a little bit? I might have a follow-up question. Sure. Um, well, think of the movie Gladiator, uh, which it's hard not to think of since it's on at least five channels on your cable package at any given moment. Uh, that's not 500 BC. That's, you remember, begins with Marcus Aurelius. So we're about 150 AD. And what's going on? Uh, the rule of law has broken down. And um, coercive power exercised through the bad guy emperor has got everybody at risk. Um, this was a constant struggle in ancient Rome uh, between uh, the powerful in alliance with the mob taking over and the conviction that had slowly built up during the Roman Republic uh, and came, I think, to a particular high point of intellectual development from, say, 150 B.C. to the death of Cicero, that this, this is just not the right way to do things. That um, you need a mixed republic in which there's a kind of monarchic uh, element, which was the Senate, uh, a democratic element, which was uh, the people, and an aristocratic element, which was the consuls. And, and, and there would be a broad, uh, Republican, small r consensus, that the rule of law would prevail. Uh, if you want to see this 
exemplified in three really wonderful novels. Uh, let me commend to you uh, Robert Harris's three novels on Cicero, where you can see this whole thing break down to the point where he, of course, eventually gets it in the neck. Um, the problem now, of course, is that the law is being used in coercive ways. I mean, in, in, I mean law is always coercion, but uh, the kind of coercion that's involved in that Canadian thing I described, I mean, would have been incomprehensible, uh, I think, to the founders of the American Republic. Yeah. The word uh, practice called tolerance has been captured by atheistic humanism and the recent issue of First Things has an article that I think uh, tries to argue uh, the limitations of that. Do you have any uh, thoughts you can share with us on the what has happened to tolerance uh, well, what has happened is what uh, my dear friend, uh, Father Richard John Newhouse, the founder of First Things, said 25 years ago. Uh, and if you go back into the archives of First Things, you can find him repeating this, thing, this theme many times. Richard used to say, tolerance is not ignoring difference as if difference made no difference. Tolerance is engaging difference within a bond of civility and respect, and with reason. Th that's tolerance. Tolerance is not saying whatever you say you are or think or whatever is OK. You know, I'm OK, you're OK, except now it's you're OK and I'm not OK. Um, tolerance is the engagement of differences. And one of the most depressing things about this electoral cycle, and it's um, decline into a form of reality TV, uh, food fight, um, is that there is no engagement of difference. I mean, there's, there is simply the assumption that the other is a w wicked, evil troglodyte. Um, and this is very, very bad for uh, democracy. Now, that has happened for any number of reasons. I think the vulgarization of our culture in general, its violence, its sexual exploitation, its general, pardon me in this chapel, crappiness. I mean, the, the lack of genuine uplift in our culture, with rare exceptions. The notion that this was not going to spill over into the political culture was obviously fatuous. It has spilled over into the political culture. This has been exacerbated by a media culture uh, that has, uh, I think, become extremely irresponsible. Uh, perhaps the most depressing statement I have heard in this entire cycle was when the president of NBC uh, was confronted with the question, and I think this was February or March, why are you guys giving all of this free airtime to Mr. Trump on the basis of his outrageousness? The president of NBC, Les Moonves, said, well, it may be bad for America, but it's great for, N for CBS. President of CBS, I work for NBC. If, if, if that had been the president of NBC, he would have had my resignation letter the next day. I mean, I would not work for a media company headed by somebody who said that publicly as if it were something okay to say. Um, so that's a huge part of the problem. And I think that can only be fixed by consumer pressure. Perhaps I was just a little slow and unable to keep up, um, but you, I think I grasped where you kicked the Jerusalem leg out from underneath your stool, but as I was attempting to follow you, I lost where the Athens leg uh, fell out. So can you maybe give me a, a bit more on how you think the Athens leg gets kicked out from underneath? Um, uh, you ever, are you a philosophy student by any chance? Ah, very good. Well, um, uh, 
Uh, I would say the, you know, depending on w which mood I'm in, I will, I will lay the first blame at Immanuel Kant or David Hume. Um, for those of you who are not uh, in this guild, uh, Kant's notion that Kant essentially destroyed what had been the center of the philosophical enterprise since Aristotle, namely metaphysics. Um, and uh, Western philosophy, with the exception of a few outliers, like my Thomistic friends and whatnot, has essentially gone along with this. Uh, and now that has, okay, then we have Hume with the fact value distinction that you can't get from an is to an ought, et cetera, et cetera, which essentially cut the legs out from any notion of a rational morality. I mean, there are moral truths built into the world. Now, it took a long time for that to work its way through, um, uh, but uh, I, you know, I, I, and I think many people are still unaware of, of what has been going on here. Uh, you're not, obviously, but when I talk to parents of high school seniors uh, and suggest to them that they need to look carefully at the philosophy department where their kid is going to school to see if there's anybody there prepared to defend the notion that there's more than your truth and my truth, they're utterly stunned. Um, but that's, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. So I think that's, those are the, those are the roots of the problem. Now, I mean, there are other dimensions of this. I would say in terms of the formation of what some of us call the autonomy project, willfulness at the center, uh, willfulness rather than reason attached to truth, at the center of the human project, the evil villain there is uh, William of Ockham. Um, who the ripple effects of that you know, are still being felt throughout uh, the Western world today. Even in unlikely places, I asked a, uh, a very distinguished Polish philosopher uh, 20 years ago, I said, how come you guys are so good at rebellion and so lousy at governance? And he said, it's very simple, Occam got here before Aquinas. <laughs> now, it's obviously not as simple as that, but there was an interesting way to, when you put will rather than reason at the center of politics, you get people who are great at fighting off Russians and Germans and Tartars and God knows what else, but not real good at making it work when they're on their own. And it's about how you understand the relation between these three legs of the stool. Uh, and I really hope to learn more from you and from your work about really why you think the uh, sacrifice of Jerusalem leg is so primary and so respectful. But here's one way it com comes to me to think about it. Some people I know who believe that philosophy and faith, revelation and reason are not harmonious, would take the line you used, I think you, the way you put it is, the creator imprinted an intelligible order on the world. We have the reason and capacity to seek to know that order. And I think many people would, some people would say, that's very important if the creator had to imprint that order on the world, rather than the errant rational order of the world. And in that little difference, they would find the conflict between yeah. faith and reason. And I just am curious how you Well, I mean, from a theological it. point of view, I would say, you know, if one attribute of, of God is his logos, his reason, his, uh, I mean, our friend Occam said, if God had wanted to make the Ten Commandments the obverse, thou shalt kill, thou shalt commit it, he can do it because God is pure will. Well, that's absurd. Um, uh, for God to create is not to imprint. It's just, I mean, if God is going to do something that is non-God, it's going to reflect those attributes of God. 
So that, from a theological point of view, that's, that's what I would say uh, to that. I am very intrigued by this um, uh, stuff coming out of the higher altitudes of theoretical physics, astrophysics, high energy particle physics, that the tolerances within which this universe exists. I mean, if something was just off by a little bit, none of this would make any sense. Um, the fact that math is, is kind of, seem, there seems to be a mathematical language built into at least the reality we know. I mean, who knows if there are, you know, lots more. Uh, this is all an interesting way to get at this. Now, I'll just uh, I'll close on this. I mean, the, uh, when I was in Jerusalem um, last uh, November, this, this came up in the form of the question of, of an incompatibility of science and religion. I mean, these are two, you know, this is C.P. Snow, the two worlds, all that stuff. I said, look, what are the two most um, dynamic, world, historical, changing, scientific things of our time? Uh, it's genetic theory and all that has come out of that, and it's the, the cosmology of the Big Bang. And both of those were thought first by Catholic priests. Gregor Mendel in genetics, and I can never remember the gay, name of the Belgian guy who came up with the Big Bang. Uh, pardon? La Maitre. La right. Um, that ought to tell you something. Uh, it doesn't tell you everything, but it ought to indicate that this kind of wooden-headed, uh, there's science here and there's religion there. Well, unless you want to say that Mendel and Lemaitre were schizophrenics or split personalities or something, you have to conjure with the fact that, um, that there's a connection here. Uh, at least there was for them. And that might mean something. So, thanks all very much. Great to see you again.